Hey everyone in Chem 40 S and Chem 40 H, welcome to lecture one of unit five. It's Dr. Carroll here. This topic, this unit is all about solubility. And if you aren't part of the solution, you're part of the precipitate. Now some of you are saying, hey, we did solubility in grade 11. Well, we're going to do it in more detail this year and we're going to focus lots on how solubility is actually an equilibrium, especially when we're talking about saturated solution. So let's begin and our first lecture will be on some preliminaries about solubility. So let's look at some definitions. A solution is a system, that's my pen here, there we go. A solution is a system with the same composition throughout. So if I have a glass of Sprite, I'm going to have some carbon dioxide dissolved through the water and some sugar in the water. And if I have the same amounts evenly distributed throughout, it's called a homogeneous mixture, also known as a solution. If I grab some sand and some rocks from the sh lovely shores of Lake Winnipeg, then I have a heterogeneous mixture. I don't have a solution. So. Uh, a reminder of the different notations we use for phases. We can talk about a solid being S, a crystal, CR, precipitate, PPT, or also PPTE is another uh, abbreviation for precipitate. Uh, liquid and aqueous, remember those are different ideas. If I, if I take sodium chloride um, and I just heat the living daylights out of solid sodium chloride and make it into a liquid or molten sodium chloride. That's different if I take sodium chloride and dissolve it in water, and that would be aqueous sodium chloride or aqueous, however you want to pronounce it. Then I have a gas, which is a G. I could also write it as a V for vapor. So those are some symbols that we're going to use. And let's look at some different types of solutions. And you can see examples of these in the videos curated to us in our lovely website under Unit 5 videos. So different types of solutions. Well, we can have a gas dissolved in a gas. For example, natural gas, which is mostly methane, but there can be some propane dissolved in it. The smaller composition is the solute. The larger the composition is the solvent. So propane would be the solute and the natural gas methane would be the solvent. Air, well, that's a mixture with nitrogen being our highest volume percent, around 79%, then oxygen around 20%, and then hydrogen, helium, argon's another one. Uh, but there's an even distribution, so we can think of the gas solution air. We can put a gas in a liquid, for example, we talked about already Sprite, where you got carbon dioxide gas put into water. Some of you have those soda streams, so you can make your sparkling water, add some flavor, and it's yummy, right? Um, blood, well, blood's not really a solution, but uh, you can approximate it as that, where you have oxygen dissolved in the blood. If you just have oxygen dissolved in water, that's a solution as well. And uh, interesting things about gas in a liquid, if you increase the temperature, not all, but most gases, the solubility decreases. So when you're boiling water, which I did earlier today when I made some spaghetti and was very proud of myself, the first bubbles that come out are the oxygen dissolved in the water and then your H2O vapor comes out. So higher the temperature, less the solubility of uh, the gas. That's why on a hot day in the summer in Lake Winnipeg, you might see some dead fish along the shore because um, the fish are trying to get to the oxygen, but the oxygen is escaping. Also, it's like Winnipeg. Therefore, you're going to have some dead fish, right? Um, as the pressure goes up, the solubility of the gas goes up. So if you're making pressurized Sprite, which you would be, it doesn't taste good when it's flat, you're going to put in a pressurized gas into a liquid. When you open the lid, then the gas quickly escapes. And as time goes by, it gets flat and doesn't taste as good. You can buy, sometimes they have these things, they're called like uh, fizz keepers or something, these little plastic uh, discs that you can put over your can of Sprite, Coke, whatever. Uh, 
but they don't work that well because the initial opening of the pop can is where the greatest pressure difference happens. Okay, so that's some interesting stuff about gases in a liquid. You could also dissolve a gas in a solid like whipped cream, cool whip, uh, styrofoams, gels. There you have gases dissolved in, in solids. Okay, and depending on the pressure, you can get all sorts of interesting things. Then we can have uh, liquids dissolved in a liquid. Example, uh, alcohols, where I can have grain alcohol and dissolve it in water. We may recall from last year, grade 11, like dissolves like, so alcohol is a polar molecule. Water is polar, we know that from this year as well. So uh, they dissolve in each other. We say that they are miscible, M-I-S-C-I-B-L-E. You dissolve alcohol in the water. If you're staring at a glass of beer, which you shouldn't be, unless you're 18, and even then you don't have to, I don't, uh, you don't see two layers in a bottle of beer, right? So uh, what else here? We've got benzene dissolving in toluene. Now that can be used in some of those uh, goof-off or goo-gone uh, solutions, which try to remove adhesive uh, remnants from a wall. Let's say um, benzene and toluene are pretty close molecular structures, so you can dissolve benzene nonpolar easily in toluene. So that's one liquid in another. The solvent would be the one of greater amount. Oil and vinegar, well, that doesn't dissolve because oil is nonpolar and vinegar is polar. So that would be immiscible. Uh, how am I going to spell that? I-M-M-I-S-C-I-B-L-E. Not inadmissible, but immiscible. So uh, we have that. Okay, so I had a little pause there, but we're back. And um, yeah, we're talking about oil and vinegar, but this is also like oil and water don't mix well either, right? So if you have a fire on your uh, stovetop, a grease fire, let's say, and you pour water on, then your grease is going to surf on top of the water and it will uh, spread more. So make sure you have a good fire extinguisher, fire blanket, or a way to starve the fire. We didn't start the fire, did we? Okay, so miscible and immiscible, important concepts, dissolving liquids in liquids. Sometimes you'll see uh, these kinds of multicolored cocktails at a bar and they'll all be different colors, but that's just a density trick to temporarily have a parfait of colors and then you shake it a bit and all this comes this sort of cruddy brownish color. Um, then what else we got? We got here a solid in a solid. So you can make an alloy, right? Like bronze, pewter, brass. Those are all alloys of copper and zinc, copper and tin, lead and things, different kinds of alloys, a whole bunch. And ideally, one day this may happen, that alloys will be made in outer space because then there's less gravity. So you get a much better mix of what's going on. So that's a solid in a solid. The kind of solution we're going to look at the most in this chapter is dissolving a solid in a liquid. So the solute is the solid, dissolves in the solvent, which is the liquid, to make up a solution. Okay, so two kinds of solutions. One in, in that form, one is an ionic solution. So you take sodium chloride, for example, and you're going to... Uh, dissolve it in water and it really doesn't stay as a molecular sodium chloride rather it ionizes into the cation and the anion if it ionizes easily and lots dissolves if all that happens you call it a strong electrolyte which sodium chloride is is that means the ions that are formed are going to conduct electricity well and we need strong electrolytes in our bodies to help with our nerve transmissions and um, things like Gatorade make a big deal about this and say, oh, we're going to add extra electrolytes. And part of it is marketing. Um, and some of you guys who are athletes know much more about that than me with the electrolyte balances. Um, sodium chloride solution. Well, it has hydration spheres. What does that mean? It means the water molecules are going to 
surround themselves around the cations and the anions. Let me draw it over here as well. So if I got Na plus, well, yeah, you're gonna have water around it, but you're gonna have the oxygen oriented towards the sodium because the oxygen is my partial negative end of the uh, water molecule. Hydrogen is the partial positive end, okay? So, and then I have these interactions And so that's one hydration sphere. I can't draw going out of the board and into the board, but you could see that happen. In the PHET simulations, you can look at one called Salts and Solubility. It sounds like some Jane Austen novel or something like that. Uh, and uh, you can see a nice uh, drawing and simulation of hydration spheres. When I look at the chloride, well, if I'm dissolving the sodium chloride in water, the water says, hey, come on in. The water's cold, right? And the chloride, well, there it would, most of the molecules would have the hydrogen end, uh, actually the midpoint between the hydrogens, um, oriented closer to the chlorine because the hydrogen end is my partial positive end. So you get these hydration spheres going on, and I didn't draw the lone pairs in, but. Uh, we get our dissolving if it's energetically and entropy entropy favored to make that happen there's always a battle well not always a battle sometimes a battle sometimes they work together so um that is an ionic solution sounds like someone's making a solution in the other room where i'm doing this using a blender or something to mix one thing in with something else um and lots of ionic compounds are strong electrolytes. They dissolve easily in water. Calcium chloride, potassium iodide, the, the group one and group two. Well, not all the group two, not all the group two, but certainly the group one, the alkali metals, all dissolves nicely, has this ammonium. Some of the group two uh, ionic compounds dissolve easily, and the more easily they dissolve, the stronger they are in terms of being an electrolyte. Another kind of solution that we spend a little less time on in this chapter is the covalent solution, where you have something like sugar and you just dissolve it in water and the sugar does not break apart into cations and anions. It just remains in a molecular form with water surrounding it. So here I have glucose, C6H12O6 solid, dissolve in water to get C6H12O6 uh, liquid. Okay, um, now a little aside, how can we make things dissolve more easily? Oh, by the way, the covalent solutions, they're going to be non-electrolytes. If they're not forming ions, then they are going to conduct electricity. Well, non-electrolyte. Okay, so you can have a strong electrolyte, which are ionic compounds that dissolve easily. Weak electrolyte are ionic compounds that dissolve just a bit. And then non-electrolyte are covalent compounds, which whether they dissolve easily or not, they do not form ions, so they don't conduct electricity well. Little aside there, how can you make dissolving more quick? In, in other words, increase the rate of solvation. So you can stir, shake, agitate. Agitate means uh, shake. It's another way for it. The agitator in your uh, washer is the uh, thing with the fins on it that spins around and shakes things around. I can increase the surface area. We looked at that in unit three, didn't we? Chop things up into finer powder so they'll dissolve more easily. Increase the temperature. Now that's not for all compounds, but for most systems increasing the temperature means more solid can dissolve in a given amount of solvent and you may remember some of those charts from grade 11 those lovely solubility curves versus temperature is it's unsaturated saturated super saturated is that bringing back good dreams or nightmares i'm not sure uh adding more fresh solvent can cause things to dissolve more easily more collisions with the solutes uh increased pressure Okay, you want to push more gases in there, fine. Adding a catalyst, yeah, that could increase the rate of the solvation. So, some different kinds of solutions uh, in terms of 
equilibrium or not. And one is called an unsaturated solution. And again, this is something you may have looked at in grade 11. Unsaturated solution is not yet at equilibrium. So I can dissolve more solutes in a given amount of solvent as I try to get to equilibrium, but I'm not at equilibrium uh, as of yet. Um, so that's unsaturated. Supersaturated is also not at equilibrium. And what you do is a temperature trick to temporarily allow more solid to be dissolved than the saturation limit allows. And then you can try to get equilibrium by causing precipitation, adding a seed crystal to make that happen, or cause some sort of vibrations or scratch a wall in a beaker uh, or flex a metal disc, something to get the solute out of the solution. So I could just sort of sketch that here some blank space here. Let's say I'm at 20 degrees Celsius. I got some water and then I dump in some sodium chloride. Then I go and ramp up to 50 degrees Celsius and I can dump in more sodium chloride. And then I slowly cool down very carefully, undisturbed like back to 20 degrees Celsius. And the amount I added in stays in uh, solution so I don't see it coming out of the solution yet but then when I scratch it or something or disturb it then I start to fall out get this little uh, region of solid coming out of solution so now uh, my supersaturation is being observed as a coming out of solution if I put in a little seed crystal just like seeding the clouds which you may have heard of put these little particles and then uh, the water vapor has a place to deposit itself on. It's called the nucleation site, nucleation sites. Uh, and then it allows to come out just like snow. You need some dust for a nucleation site for the snow to come out. Okay, on to page three, a saturated solution. Saturated solution is at dynamic equilibrium. So in a saturated solution, the rate of precipitation equals the rate of dissolving. So I can dissolve sodium chloride, it's unsaturated, 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 till just a little crystal is formed, then I get a saturated solution. If I dump more in, as long as I don't change the temperature, it doesn't change the fact that it's saturated. So my equation of solubility, I can call this an equation A solubility, or also called a solubility equation, SE, has the solid on the left and an equilibrium symbol, and then I got the cation and a plus on the right and the chloride on the right. And you see a picture of it over here. So that is a saturated solution. And we talk about solubility, we focus mostly on saturated solution. If I'm making an IV bag, let's say a saline solution in an IV bag, well, I don't want to make the solution saturated because then I got little crystals going around and they're gonna clog up the tubes that are going into my veins, right? So your IV bag, you wanna have it unsaturated. You could have it close to the saturation limit, but you don't want it to be at the saturation limit because you want your IV bag to have uh, no crystals floating around in it. That's also why you have to, uh, let's say you have an antibiotic inside a saline solution, you have to make sure that those chemicals don't react and create a precipitate, create a solid, because that would gum up the works, as they say. Okay, so what else do we got going on here? Uh, just definitions of solubility. I want to find out how much, using sodium chloride as an example here, the amount of sodium chloride needed to create the saturated solution per given amount of solvent is called the solubility of NaCl. So to get to the uh, saturated solution, you can have solubility in grams per mil, uh, grams per gram, grams per hundred mil, grams per liter, moles per liter. There's around half a dozen common solubility units that we use. So uh, here we're going to use grams of solute per hundred grams of solvent. So it turns out, and you would be given this, you don't memorize it, at 25 degrees Celsius, you could dissolve 36.2 grams of sodium chloride in 100 grams of water. 
So let's look at an example. Given that, that's a lot, isn't it? How many grams of sodium chloride could you dissolve in three quarters of a kilogram of water to create a saturated solution? Three quarters of a kilogram is 750 grams. So if I have 36.2 grams of sodium chloride in 100 grams of water and 750 grams of water, I would have seven and a half times as much, right? So you'd have 271 point five grams of NaCl. Okay, let's get rid of that. And um, so you should be able to handle these kinds of questions. Here's another one. How many grams of some solid AB, I don't know what it is, could be added to 400 mils of water to create a saturated solution if the solubility of AB is given as 32.5 grams of AB in 100 grams of water? First thing to note is we're going to make an approximation. If we talk about mils of water, it's the same as grams of water. So in other words, the density of water is going to be, for our purposes, one gram per mil. I know it's slightly different and it's temperature dependent, but this is close enough for what we want to do. So 400 mils is the same as 400 grams. So if I can dissolve 32.5 grams of AB in 100 grams of water. If I have 400 grams of water, I can dissolve four times as much. So 130 grams of AB. If I want to dissolve more solute, I'm going to need more solvent. Good. Good. Okay. On to page four. Now I already mentioned these, but uh, we need some practice here. These are solubility equations, SE, also known as equations of solubility. So we've already written the first one, uh, C6H12O6 solid goes to C6H12O6 aqueous. That's a non-electrolyte, a molecular compound. You always put the solid first and the aqueous is on the right-hand side. KCl solid goes to K plus aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous. That is a uh, strong electrolyte. Now here AgCl solid goes to Ag plus aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous. That is a weak electrolyte. This is going to be weak because it doesn't dissolve easily. We say it's sparingly soluble, so it's a weak electrolyte. Um, how do I know that? There's a chart in your booklet uh, with all these little squares in it, and some of you may have used a chart from grade 11 for solubility. If you want to use that one, go ahead. I like the one with the little squares in it, and uh, it's in your booklet, and so you just read across and see that silver cation with chloride anion gives you a sparingly soluble or insoluble or non-soluble. Non-soluble, we don't really use that that much. I don't want to use that term. Let's use insoluble. That's more commonly used. So maybe somewhere you'll see non-soluble. Most of the time, insoluble is sparingly soluble. But nothing is completely insoluble. So sparingly, right? Sparingly means not a lot, right? Sparingly, just a little. Some, not all silver uh, compounds are sparingly soluble. Some are soluble. It depends what the anion is. Like with nitrates, all nitrates are soluble. So silver nitrate is soluble. Anything which has nitrate as an anion is going to be soluble. Lead, well, some leads are soluble, some aren't. Here we got lead iodide in example four. Goes to lead two plus, plus two I minus. Just like I said, we lead Roman numeral two iodide. And so that is going to be a weak uh, electrolyte. If you look at that, those solubility, qualitative solubility chart is what I'm talking about. FeCl3 goes to Fe3 plus plus 3Cl minus. FeCl2 goes to Fe2 plus plus 2Cl minus. And I'll let you decide whether that's sparingly soluble or uh, not. Then I have sodium carbonate. I know that that one is very soluble. And A2CO3 goes to 2Na plus plus CO3, 2 minus. So that is soluble. Okay, let's get rid of all that part there. So you can as you can fill in uh, all those. Silver chromate, I know that one is sparingly soluble. And on and on. So um, zinc sulfide, off the top of my head, I'm not sure what that one is. I know that some sulfides are soluble and uh, some aren't. So um, those are some examples. You can go through them 
and uh, then you can check on the net if you uh, got them all right. You know, you can Google is copper nitrate soluble. Well, I'll tell you, all nitrates are soluble. Is lead bromide soluble? And then some students say, well, how do I know? What's the criterion? And different books say different things. So this can be quite annoying, but uh, many lead compounds are sparingly soluble, including lead bromide. And some of them you won't find. Okay, so then here's uh, some practice you can do on your own to decide if something's soluble or not. These seven examples over here on page four. Okay. So um, we looked at the solubility equation, but there's other equations which are associated with the possible formation of a precipitate. There's a thing called the overall molecular equation. Some people just call it the overall equation. And it's really not molecules at all, but it works okay if we say molecule. And we think of that as a double replacement reaction. So I call that the OME. Then there's the complete ionic equation where you break down the uh, compounds into cations and anion groups, except for the possible precipitate. That one you don't break down, but you break down everything else into the cation groups and the anion groups. Sometimes they're monatomic cation and or anion groups, and sometimes they're polyatomic cation and or anion groups. Net ionic equation, that's where the action is. In the complete ionic equation, you see the spectator ions, the ones just watching the action, so you cancel those out, and that's where you get uh, the net ionic equation. So let's say we got uh, magnesium nitrate and sodium hydroxide. Remember, these equations have to be balanced. If you don't balance them, then all heck happens, okay? You got to balance them. So magnesium nitrate plus sodium hydroxide is going to give me magnesium hydroxide plus... Um, sodium nitrate make sure everything's balanced and that's my overall equation if i want to break it down i'm going to get mg2 plus plus 2 no3 minus plus 2 na plus plus 2 aoh minus remember that you got to distribute that 2 to both the cation and the anion uh, magnesium hydroxide according to the qualitative solubility table is just sparingly soluble so this s here stands for a solid now that's annoys everyone on the planet because they say, oh no, S is for soluble. Well, if I have it in parentheses, no, it's not for soluble, it's for solid. So if you want to write PPTE instead of solid, go ahead. Uh, plus two Na plus aqueous plus two NO3 minus aqueous. So you see that my spectators are my Na pluses and my NO3 minus. They're my spectator ions, so I can gently put a slash through them. I wouldn't erase them because I want you to be able to to check that you know how to write the complete ionic equation as well. So the net ionic equation becomes magnesium 2 plus aqueous plus 2 OH minus aqueous goes to magnesium OH2 solid. Which you may note is just the reverse way of writing the solubility equation. The solubility equation you would write MgOH2 solid goes to Mg2 plus aqueous plus 2 OH minus. Okay. Second example, we got silver nitrate plus iron uh, three chloride. So I just give you the reactants there and names and you got to fill in the products knowing that it is a double replacement reaction. So balancing it, I'm going to have three moles of AgNO3 plus one mole of FeCl3 goes to three moles of AgCl solid. That's our most likely precipitate plus one mole of iron Roman numeral three nitrate. Complete ionic equation, three Ag plus plus three NO3 minus plus Fe3 plus plus three Cl minus, all aqueous goes to three AgL solid plus Fe3 plus aqueous plus three NO3 minus aqueous. And yes, you have to put in the phases here because the phases is very important. You've got to put in your aqueouses and your solids. So my net ionic equation becomes I get rid of the spectator ions. What are the spectators? Fe3 plus is one. Nitrates. Nitrates are always going to be a spectator ion because it's not going to form a precipitate. So I end up with 3 Ag plus plus 3 Cl minus goes to 3 Ag Cl. If you wrote that on an assignment, I would mark it wrong because the net ionic equation 
is by definition the simplest whole number ratio the simplest whole number ratio so 333 three, three can be reduced to 111 so my net ionic equation is uh, ag plus aqueous plus cl minus aqueous goes to agcl solid if it turns out the the qualitative uh, solubility table says that neither product formed is going to be sparingly soluble, then there would not be a reaction. So my net ionic equation would, I would write no reaction or NR. And that happens sometimes. And sometimes you want that to happen. You want to mix two chemicals together without a precipitate coming out. You want them just to keep swimming around, like in what we're talking about, antibiotics in an IV bag. Okay, so um, here's some practice questions for you to try on page four, these first four ones. And if you don't find some in the table, well, look on the net and find other tables for that. Okay, so that's good enough for the first uh, lecture, and I'll find some other practice sheets for you to do. And we'll talk about KSP, the equilibrium product constant, in lecture number two. Sounds good to me.